Hey everybody, it's Ryan from the Breaking Bad Show. Taking a little afternoon stroll to uh, get a little fresh air. It's starting to warm warm up a bit, um, even though it is yeah, kind of gloomy outside today. So over the course of my police career, I got sued twice, and I can tell from ex I can tell you from experience. Getting sued is one of the most stressful things that you can deal with as a police officer when you're the subject of a, of a lawsuit. And I think one of the areas that we're most likely to get sued because of would be our defense tactics or use of force incident. However, even though it's one of the most likely areas to get sued, it's often where we train the least. So many officers I talk to, they have minimal defense tactics training, whether it's yearly at best. So our guest today, John Brincato, he is a martial arts instructor and he advocates having more defense, more and regular defense tactics training in law enforcement. And on today's show, we have a great conversation about some of the things that can be done and how we can implement that and get more defense tactics training in the police training so that officers can protect themselves and ultimately the citizens that we deal with out on the street. We hope you stay tuned and enjoy the great conversation we're about to have. This is the Breaking Bad Show. Hey everybody, how you doing? Welcome back to another episode of Breaking Badge. I'm Chad Bruckner. I'm Ryan Chartrand. And we're happy to be with you again. This thing keeps going and we really enjoy doing it. So today we have an awesome episode, a special treat for you. Something that, again, you don't hear a lot about. And Ryan and I are always trying to bring on guests that are going to bring something different to the table, challenge your perspective, frankly, talk about things that a lot of us don't talk about. And that's what we're going to do today with John Broncato. He is the owner of the Non-Lethal Compliance Arrest and Training Company. I hope I said that right, John. NCAT, yep. is that what we call it, NCAT? NCAT, yep, NCAT. NCAT. And um, he, he is a martial arts guru, defensive tactics guru, and we are really going to get into it today. So, John, thanks for being here. Welcome to the show. My pleasure. Welcome to the show, for John. Thank you. John, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, uh, educate our viewers on who you are and what you do. Well, I started martial arts way back in 1984. Um, actually started boxing in like 76, actually. I guess right around the time the Rocky movies came out, when every other 13-year-old was running into boxing gyms. <laughs> <laughs> and I subsequently graduated to, uh, to martial arts. I started uh, Taekwondo first. I uh, got my black belt in, in that art uh, after it was about probably about three years after that. But I think the, the turning sign for me for combatives and self-defense came from when on, on our black belt test, they brought out knives, which is something we never saw before. And right before the test, they showed us like a couple of techniques and we did them all. But right after that, I said I would be dead in the street. So Taekwondo went by the wayside, but I actually think it's a very good martial art to learn with because it teaches you probably one of the most important things and one of the most difficult things that it is to actually teach a student, which is to move. Most people don't, they just, their bodies don't move. They just really don't know how to move their bodies. And Taekwondo is actually something I would recommend for everybody if you're going to start in martial arts, because I think it gives you an edge up on everybody else. Uh, then I moved over to Japanese Jiu Jitsu. Um, Obviously, with BJJ now, as soon as I say jujitsu, everybody thinks BJJ, but no, Japanese jujitsu. And there's not many practitioners of Japanese jujitsu, especially here in the States. And I think probably one of the reasons is that, you know, it's pretty tough. You know, it's tough on your body. It's tough on your joints. It's tough taking 30, 40 falls per class and still getting up and going to work the next day. You know, and as you get older, it gets even tougher. Um, but, you know, it really teaches you the whole gamut of martial arts. So we train Everything from stand up, knife fighting, defenses, gun defenses, throws, sweeps, arm locks, uh, arm bars, wrist techniques, uh, arresting techniques, detaining techniques, kicks, obviously, kicks, punches, throws. We do a lot of throws, a lot of sweeps. 
Um, and to me, it's just an all-inclusive type of art. So, and then I also train and teach in a classical Japanese jujitsu system, and that that system actually originated in 1650, and it's still being practiced today in Japan. So the whole lineage is there for you to see. There's no break in the lineage from 1650. So our system, our modern Japanese jujitsu system, was actually expelled from that um, classical system. So, you know, real samurai stuff, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, it works, you know, even a couple of hundred years later, it's still the basics still work for that. And then I did a lot of uh, knife training, a lot of sword training. Um, I also uh, teach sword. I also teach knife. Um, we do a lot of test cutting, which is called Tamashigiri, where you're actually using a live blade to actually cut. So it really shows you whether or not your cuts are effective. And I think with the surprises for people is how easy it is to cut, you know, and when we, when we roll the mats up, because you have to soak them in water for 24 hours, it really mimics somebody's limb. So the, the density of it, because it's soaked with water, it's so easy to cut. And I think that really surprises them the most. They're like, that would have really been an arm. And I say, yes, that really would have been an arm because, you know, especially the katana, which is the famous samurai blade is really just, it's a razor blade on a stick. You know, it's ridiculously sharp and it doesn't really take much to, to cut somebody. So the, the katana, uh, I'm a huge Ninja Turtle fan. So growing up, I used to love, <laughs> you know, Leonardo and his katanas. And, uh, it's just, you say katana and you're thinking like traditional and I think Ninja Turtle. So not, not, not to disrespect, but, um, okay. I, I love this topic because it's something that Ryan and I talk about as far as wellness and, not only physical wellness, but emotional, mental, spiritual, but mm -hmm. physical wellness is so important and, and tactics and all these things that police officers have to do every day. And I just feel like uh, we don't take it seriously. I feel like we say we do, but yep. to me, the proof's in the pudding of how yep. often we actually train and are we committed to these, this test? So 100%. my question for first question for you is why do you think so many agencies struggle with committing time for defensive tactics, committing time for self-defense, something that possibly every single day could happen to us. Uh, it obviously, it doesn't. But look, why are agencies, organizations so deficient in that kind of training? Well, I think some of it, obviously, is politics, right? So I, I believe the longer the higher ups are in office, you know, it becomes sort of like, you know, a monarchy, right? So whatever they say goes. And unfortunately, I think many of those guys forgot what it was like to be like on the street especially if you're talking about NYPD. So if you're talking about the 70s and 80s that were rough here, but you're talking about what's happening now, I think the cops now are by far much more of a target than they were in the 70s and 80s. And I think uh, going back to the training part uh, aspect of it is, I think some guys are lazy. You know, let's face it, it's, it's a tough job, right? You get the hell beat out of you physically and emotionally and mentally and NYPD financially because they're not the best payers, right? When it comes to paying law enforcement, but you get the prestige of being, you know, a member of the NYPD, but it's difficult to pay your rent and your mortgage and things like that. And I think some of it has to do with the misunderstanding that all martial arts are violent. That's what I think some of it comes down to because I, I believe if you don't really have an in-depth knowledge of it, you think martial arts, you think I can kill whoever I want to kill. And that's not necessarily the case. Are there people that do that? Sure. Just like are there boxers that get into street fights all the time? Absolutely. But those guys don't have discipline. I think the martial arts part of it will teach them discipline, will help them emotionally, and will help them actually be able to de-escalate. Because I think part of the problem, you know, I'm only talking NYPD because they're, they're most of the guys that I see, but I do see outside um, departments as well. It's a total lack of confidence. So if you don't have a con if you don't have any confidence in your ability to be able to handle, obviously not a sniper from three blocks away, but any weapon defense, knife defense, bat defense, stick defense, chain defense, whatever it is, if you don't have the ability and you don't have the confidence that you do have the ability, I think the first thing that happens is that you're threat mechanism is raised immediately or higher for you than somebody who has that confidence. So therefore you start to go towards deadly force much quicker than somebody that can handle themselves unarmed. My pet peeve here, which I just wrote an article on LinkedIn, I don't know if you guys saw it last week, is BJJ. You know, all these departments, if they do train at all, it's BJJ. 
And I'm going, why is it only BJJ? And I'm not saying it's, it's bad. What I'm saying is as a sole practitioner of that training mechanism, it's terrible because it's only giving you one facet of the whole realm of what you need to know from self-defense, right? That's like, I mean, Taekwondo, I sort of feel like the same way. It teaches you how to punch and kick, but it doesn't teach you any weapons defense. It doesn't teach you how to throw. It doesn't teach you how to detain, right? It doesn't teach you any of that. So I think if you're saying that you're, you need to learn self-defense, especially from a law enforcement perspective, you need to have the whole gamut of whatever could possibly be thrown at you and being able to have at least some basic knowledge to be able to get out of that. And I think the final part of it is actual politics, politician politics. And they just, especially here in New York City, they just don't want to spend the money. They don't think it's well spent. You know, they're defunding everything, right? NYPD was defunded almost a billion dollars. Some of it they gave back. But could you imagine defunding a police department a billion dollars and expecting that nothing negative is going to come of that? You know, so obviously when training goes out the window, the lawsuits increase because I believe because of lack of training, guys get heavy handed because they don't know how to handle somebody. I mean, you, you've all seen the same YouTube videos I have, right? They're trying to lock somebody up. The guy's not interested in going. And right away, there's eight cops piled on him. And I look at that and I go, why? Why are there eight guys on one guy? At a minimum, why doesn't one guy just volunteer to grab his legs? Where's he going after that? And yeah, one guy just pushed him over and now the guy's on the floor. You know, so I don't, I don't understand, you know, why that, why that type of skill is not really taught, number one. And number two, getting back to the money aspect of it, I think from a political standpoint, you know, NYPD has what, 35,000 and change now on the department. So their theory is, look, if I have to spend, you know, 15,000, 20,000, 50,000 a year per officer, that's a lot of money, right? And I go, yeah, absolutely is a lot of money. But then my rebuttal to that is in 2019, New York City on behalf of the NYPD and the gracious citizens of the city of New York paid out over $90 million in excessive force claims, settlements and lawsuits. So you're paying it out anyway, right? But you're paying $90 million. So what I'm saying is that if you, even if you took a third of that and dedicated it to training, but you also have to look at the other aspect. Training has to be mandatory. And at the end of every year, like you qualify for firearms, you qualify for defensive tactical training. You have to be proficient or you go back to class or you lose pay, whatever it is. But it has to be something where these guys are on board and they know that their feet are going to be held to the fire at the end of the year because they have to show unarmed tactical proficiency that's non-lethal, you know, because if you look at what officers have to defend themselves, right, they have their, their body, their hands, mostly, right, you have tasers, you have batons, and you have firearms, the only thing they really train on is firearms, and that's haphazardly from the cops that I know, they only train when they know that they're going to be, they're going for qualifications, right, so the least lethal, which are your hands, nobody ever trains in, the, the uh, tasers only deploy half the time. And then when they do deploy, 25% of the time, they don't work. And then you have batons. These guys don't even remember that they have a baton on their belt. They don't even know how to use it. So, you know, and then you go right to the firearm. So, you know, so I guess an answer to your question is a whole perspective as to why guys really, you know, aren't training. And to be honest with you, some of the guys that do train when they finally do come to me, it's because they had an incident. You know, it's after the fact, you know, and that's what I really want to stop. I want to stop the after part. You know, John, I, 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 answer, right? Yeah, no, that was, that was great. There was, there was a lot of, a lot of things that you brought up that are all, you know, important topics. And just to, to follow that up, I know when, when I was, when I was a police officer, we did about four hours of defense tactics training um per year we are we, we do four hours on handcuffing four hours on pepper spray and mm -hmm. four hours on um the baton mm -hmm. and the whole point was go there get the you know quote curriculum done as quick as we can so we can get out of there with our four hours pay right and 
you know, knowing, knowing that that you know, was not significant. I mean, you went through the motions. It was yep. really, and the, the, I could sit here all day and talk about reasons why they did that, whether it was pay, whether it was administration, not wanting you to get hurt during training, things like that. Ultimately, when, when things happen, whether it's us getting hurt out on the street, whether it's us getting sued, you know, the number one people that suffer are the police officers. Mm -hmm. We're very quick to blame the departments for not offering this training and everything. Ultimately, who do you feel is responsible for the officer getting that their personal self-defense trainings? Well, ultimately, it's the county and the city that employ them. Right. To me, an officer is no different than a regular employee working at XYZ Corporation. How do you expect that employee to properly do their job without properly being trained? Right. Except that in this case, we live in such a litigious society that right away the cameras come out. Everybody starts recording when the officer needs help. Nobody helps them. But they're very quick to you know, put the video on YouTube and Instagram and they bring it on to the six o'clock news. You know, but ultimately, I think counties that that don't offer it or offer it haphazardly or in a limited capacity, leave themselves open for lawsuits. That's what I think they really don't get. You know, because if your officer really manhandles somebody, let's say really slams somebody to the floor, cracks the guy's head open, the guy dies, right? One of the first questions the attorney is going to ask is, well, where'd you get your training from? Oh, we don't, there is no training. How's, How's there no training? That, that, that doesn't make any sense, right? So I think ultimately that's exactly what happens. But I think when you get to other departments, you know, they do it like you say, you get four hours here, three hours there, four hours there, or, or you get it all in one time or whatever the case is. I understand training is an issue. I understand scheduling it is even more of an issue, especially for a department like the NYPD. But your job as the politicians and your job as the, company or the NYPD in this case, is to protect your employee, which is the members of the NYPD, but also to protect society, right? So you have to do whatever you need to do in order to be able to accomplish both of those jobs. You know, and training is absolutely the key. I mean, if you don't train, if you don't train on a regular basis, on a couple of hours per week, the muscle memory of whatever it is that's being shown to you will never set in. And the, the, one of the things that I like to do is I like to do stress test training or stress test scenarios. So I could show you whatever technique, doesn't really matter what it is. And I could hammer it into you. You know it backwards and forwards and upside down, it doesn't matter. But as soon as I change the variable of violence and put you out on the street in a uniform and that happens, all that's gonna be gone. Because under the stress, you know, the adrenaline takes over and everything you learn is gone. So not only do you need to train these officers on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, they really need to be trained. They need to be stress trained for these conditions and these types of defenses, but they're not doing it. You know, so if I show you a couple of throws or a couple of knife defenses or whatever it is, and I send you on your way and you never practice them again until God forbid that one time in the street, that's not what's coming out. That firearm is coming out first, right? And unfortunately, that's exactly what happens. So then, you know, you have the city is at fault, the politicians are at fault. And sometimes, not all the time, sometimes the officer is at fault, right? Because if he feels that his life is in danger on the street, he needs or she needs to get their own training outside the department, right? But the other question becomes, who pays for it, right? If you're on a strict budget because you're trying to live on a cop salary, the money is not easy. It's not flowing easily. You have a house, wife, two kids, three kids, whatever it is. You know, now all of a sudden you have to spend a couple hundred dollars a month on training, which is why what I think should happen is that whether it's federally mandated or state mandated, whatever it is, there should be a mandatory number of hours that an officer has to train, period, period. Like uh, I believe New Jersey, it's been sitting, it's been sitting in the Senate in New Jersey for quite some time, but if I remember right, they have something on the books that they're looking to vote on where um, they're going to increase their academy um, defensive training, I think by 94 hours by the time you get out of the academy. And then annually, I believe it's 104 hours annually that each officer has to train. 
But see, I believe also that part of the problem is there that nobody has any money. Clearly they have it. They're just not spending it towards that. And they're using that funding issue as a reason why they're not actually passing the bill. But, you know, like I say all the time, you know, again, does the city of New York like paying $90 million for excessive force claims? Do they like having the NYPD <clears throat> shown as being manhandlers, you know, or is it the general public? <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, the general public, obviously their behavior needs to be reeled in, right? So, but that's a, that's, that's for another podcast. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah that's, a, that's, that's a whole another, other can of worms. A whole, other, whole other podcast. <laughs> but, you know, but the training part, you know, again, if you want, if you want these officers to be protected and you want them to be able to protect the public, which is now becoming increasingly violent, and litigious, like I said before, you need to put something else in the arsenal besides being able to go to a firearm. You should have, in my opinion, you should be, you should be really proficient in unarmed defensive skills. You should be really proficient in baton skills. And those two things alone would lead to less firearm discharges because you already have two other things that you're experts in before you get to that stage. And I think that's a better defense you know, when you say, look, you know, when you're finally going to court, which is another thing, right? They're, they're always judging cops over a six-week time frame during a trial on something that happens within four seconds, which to me is totally outlandish. But again, that's the political system that we, that we live in and the political climate that we have now. But, um, you know, I, I think if you could show that an officer has had multiple hours of training and use those training to the best of his or her ability, considering the circumstances, and then move to the next point, which was a taser and didn't work, then move to the baton, which they're an expert in baton and they're a trainer and, or whatever the case is, but they show that they have some sort of expertise in the use of the baton, then you could say, look, I exhausted these three non-lethal forces. I was only left with a firearm. Then I think you have a much better defense. Then I think there'll be much, much less claims that will be approved and settlements that are approved. Yeah. You know, I, I was, John, you're talking and I was taking notes because you said a lot of things that really resonated with, I know people are going to watch this because I, I was just talking to police officers last week about this, multiple agencies, multiple States. And first of all, my agency where I came from 13 years, we didn't do one hour of defensive tactics in 13 years, not one hour in 13 years. Um, and, and you listen to you speak and listening to the other officers I was talking to last week. I, I think organizationally, from a leadership perspective, when we and I'll give you the example, the officer I was talking to last week said that defensive tactics, they have a four hour block. It's optional. Uh, you're not going to be compensated for it. Um, if you want to come, that's on your time, your time. Um, don't put in overtime or comp time. I think organizationally. We create a culture inside internally where we tell you, we send these signals to you. This isn't important. Mm -hmm. We're not, it's not important. We're not going to reimburse you. Yes. So like over generations, organizationally, we're as leaders, we're not setting a good example. No, this is extremely important. I'm going to pay you time and a half to come in and do this because I love you and I care about you and I want you to stay safe and I love the community. I'm not going to nickel and dime anybody because this is so important. So over generations, this is something like, oh, chiefs really, this is really, really important stuff. Yes. It's the opposite. And therefore, guys, when they, even when they show up, if they even get it, I got zero hours. Even if they even get it, it's like joking around. Oh, well, you're looking at your clock. When's this over? Yeah, because yeah. organization, we've kind, of, uh, we've kind of made it a joke or something that's not to be taken seriously. So anyway, my question to you is, what would you recommend a young officer? So, there's a young officer in an agency right now, so many of them don't do any defensive tactics, have maybe sent a memo, been asking their leadership, to, you know, they're only a patrolman, there's only so much they can do. What advice would you give? Because I'm big on personal responsibility and accountability. What advice would you give to them? You're, you're looking them in the eye and they said, John, I want to train. I want to learn all this stuff. What would you say? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I could tell you what I see. <laughs> and what I see is actually embarrassing and disheartening, to be honest with you. So I see police officers that have no defensive training, haven't sought out any defensive training, have no basic defensive skills, none. So whatever was taught in the academy is completely gone. So that means I'm one, I'm, when they come to me and I'm going, what are these guys doing on the street? I mean, really, what, what are you doing on the street? That's like giving a cop a firearm, sending him out and never giving him any training. This is no different. You know, when you're really skilled, it's very easy to kill somebody. In all honesty, it really seriously is. But 
you know, and getting back to your question, as far as um, defensive skills are concerned and what they should be taking, if they have a fair amount of time, I would still start them off with Taekwondo only f- and minimum, like three to six months, only because again, it teaches them how to move, which is the most basic self-defense skill you need to learn is to not be there, right? So if something's coming at you, why would you stand in the way of a train? You wouldn't, you'd move to the side. This is the same concept. Um, then from that point, you know, obviously I would recommend Japanese jiu-jitsu because I think we're very well-rounded, right? Uh, Krav Maga is another one that's well-rounded. Um, Some of the Chinese systems, uh, Wing Chun, Kung Fu, some of those are very good because they teach weapons training as well. Um, Karate in and of itself, no, because I'm looking at, you know, what does the officer need as as much of a defensive system to help protect themselves? And that's not really, that doesn't include what I teach or what the guys at Krav Maga teach or some of the Wing Chun. Chung. Um, notice I did not say BJJ. <laughs> so, you know, if that's, you know, again, if you like to roll and that's your thing, no problem, but it should not be the only training you participate in. So again, to answer your question, if you say, you know, you can only do one thing, then I would say either Japanese jiu-jitsu, Krav Maga, or some sort of Wing Chun or Kung Fu. Wow. That is good. And I was writing some things down. Um, you said this also, and you said this earlier in your last question uh, in response and just resonated with me was the military, I'll come from the military background. So I have military and law enforcement. I, I rely on both. And I was in the army infantry. So just generally the military is much better training than law enforcement um, because training, we don't go to a training company. Uh, we don't have people we bring in. You can do that um, in the military, but every leader is a trainer. Every leader got to that point because they value knowledge. They have a, a great foundation. They're great teachers and trainers. That's one of the aspects of how they got to where they got. So when I got to staff sergeant, squad leader, uh, and all the squad leaders the same way, team leaders, which are sergeants, um, we would always break out. And you're, when you're not doing anything, you're training. You're doing room clearing. You're doing PT, uh, range stuff. I mean, you're training all the time. Where in law enforcement, I get it's different because there's shift work. and But um, we, I think we need to put, like I'm thinking about NYPD. I think we need to put the onus on leaders, junior leaders. You need to get out with your people. You want this job? You want to get promoted to sergeant? Uh, uh, lieutenant, then you need to also, one of the criteria is you need to be responsible for training your officers. That's on you, not an organization, not an officer to put a memo in. That's your responsibility to make sure they get hours in this every year, like we did in the military, instead of kind of making these excuses, well, it costs too much money or their shift work. Uh, drives me crazy. Last question. What surprises you most working with officers? What may be something that you're surprised, what you see, something you hear, what is the kind of the biggest thing that, that surprised you about defensive tactics, martial arts training with law enforcement? I think it's the lack of the most basic, plain vanilla defensive tactics. I mean, like I, I've seen NYPD members come to me with zero skill, zero, and zero, zero ability to make an arrest. I mean, I had one student that came in And many times I'll say, because everybody has their own style for cuffing, right? And their own style for detaining and everything. So I mentioned to the student, okay, you go detain me, arrest me. Let's, let's see what you have. And she couldn't do it. She couldn't make the arrest, you know, and then just, you know, like basic, basic detaining skills. Cause I think with their, see, I'm 5'8 and I weigh 160. So clearly there are many more people bigger than me, stronger than me, right? So I can only rely on technique because that's all I have. And I have students in my class that I've thrown that are twice my body weight. I wouldn't be able to do that with strength. So when you see officers, again, dogpiling or not being able to handle one-on-one or two officers on one, which again, we've all seen YouTube videos, right? That says to me, lack of, lack of even the most basic understanding of not just defensive skills, but of just body leverage. You know, half these things you just need to know and understand body leverage, but many of them just don't have that understanding. And again, I I don't know if it's because 
They don't care, not enough time, nobody's paying for it. They're not getting paid for it. They don't think it's necessary. Uh, this the, uh, Departments like the NYPD are spending more money on de-escalation and things of that nature. You know, but the thing with de-escalation is you're going to meet people that have no interest in what comes out of your mouth. You're the target because you're wearing a badge. Now what? You shoot them? That doesn't make any sense to me. That's why I think there should be technical defensive proficiency. It's, they shouldn't be allowed to leave the academy. There, there are some states that their academies are two years long. So when you come out, you have an idea of how to handle yourself. You know, and then you have other states where there is no academy. You just go on the street. I mean, to me, that's just totally insane. But, you know, if we're sticking with just a larger metropolitan areas, obviously they provide some sort of, of training. But I just think they're not, they're not putting enough emphasis on the tactical defensive training part of it because I believe perhaps they might have so much that's on the plate that the officer has to, has to learn, has to remember, has to do when they get on the street. But I think one of the things that they fail to, to remember is that out of everything an officer does, the most important thing to remember is that you have one of the most violent jobs that are out there. And it goes from zero to a hundred for violence immediately. You know, and some people just want to kill you, hurt you, or whatever, just because you have a badge on for no other reason than that. And just for that reason alone, your officers should be self-defense experts just for that alone. John, I know, I know you, you mentioned a couple of things. One thing was you talked about more training in the academy. Mm -hmm. And you also talked about the ongoing training to maintain that level of expertise. Mm -hmm. Now, I know when I was in the police academy, you know, one, the, the big thing that they taught us was the, the arm bar takedown. I don't know if that's just a Massachusetts thing, if that's a national thing. No, they, they teach it. They taught us the arm bar takedown. And, you know, I might've gotten that, got it to work once or twice in the police academy. Mm -hmm. and, you know, what, ha what happened with me, and I saw it happen with a lot of people, is that you get out into the field. The first time you try the arm bar takedown, it does not work. Especially people of my era and older what would ensue was you just fell right back to the schoolyard brawl. You ended up, whether it was, whether it was punches, headlocks, you know, whatever you needed to do to mm -hmm. subdue the person, yeah. you, you, yeah. You, dra you, you dragged them away. So there's definitely that ongoing training that needs to be done too. Now with departments, number one, we mentioned the, the financials of the departments, departments don't want to pay for it. And number two, we're starting to see right now with everything going on that there's not even the staffing to be able to, whether it's replace people on the shift or fill shifts or, or, or get mm -hmm. people to be able to train. What are, do you have any ideas on things that the department could do, whether it's budget wise or, or shift wise that would allow that training to be worked in, whether it's their regular work schedule or being able to afford, you know, implementing some form of ongoing training on a regular basis? Well, I think probably the state would have to kick in. That's what I'm thinking. One of the things, the other thing is that an officer, if an officer does train is allow him or her to be able to use that as a tax deduction, right? Like you get a uniform deduction. Why can't you get a deduction for that? It's a part of your job, right? You, you need that in order to be able to protect not only yourself, but your partner, right? So there has to be some sort of incentive or let the federal government give some sort of credits or something like that. You know, the money can be found. The problem is that they don't think it's painful enough yet. That, that's what it is. And as far as officers are concerned, yeah, listen, Florida, Florida has been poaching NYPD like crazy for the last 18 months. Why? Because the salary is like 30% higher. You get appreciation when you go down there. People are not looking to spit at you, throw stuff at you, shoot you, right? The morale is much higher, right? So, you know, you have the political setting in a place like Florida that's much difficult than the political setting that's in New York City. You know, I mean, when did it become okay to pour Gatorade on a cop's head? When did it, be, when did it become okay to push a cop to the floor? When did it become okay to try to set a police van on fire with a Molotov cocktail while cops are in the van? You know, when did that become okay? You know, so until that changes, you're going to see the same thing. Cops are going to leave because they feel like there's 
only support from within the department, which is fine, which should be automatic. And yes, you do have your law abiding citizens that will always support the police, but the, the vocal minority that does not is extremely vocal, right? You see them on the news, you see them on Twitter and Instagram and all, all these other places. And they're the ones that are screaming for defunding. You know, when I really think to some aspect, they don't really fully understand what really, what real defunding means. You know, I mean, would you really, if you're one of these people, would you really be okay with wherever your parent, your your elderly parents live or where you're, your, where you're raising your, you know, your four or five-year-old, would you be okay to living in a neighborhood where there's absolutely no police protection at all, none, and you call 911 and you get a busy signal or a disconnect? I don't know about that. That's a hard pill to swallow. I think when push comes to shove and people's, the people that are saying that you should defund when their family becomes involved and their family becomes victims, I think it becomes a different story. I could be wrong, but you know, but I think they need to pay the cops to, to show up for it, for the training. If the training needs to be mandatory and they need to be tested for it, you know, because paying is only half of it. The cop showing up and training is only half of it. They have to be tested every year to show proficiency or well, there has to be repercussions. There has to be. You know, I'm going to jump in one second. One thing you said was uh, at least, you know, inside the police department, you know, somebody's got your back or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not even always the case. I just want to throw that it's out there. Not, it's not in some cases. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's not in some cases. So but, then you're you know, dealing with the stress on the street and then you're, you're right. coming back to an agency where you're, you don't believe the command staff administration has your back or would have right. your back. Uh, yeah, that's a. But, uh, that's, but I think a lot of those guys that you're mentioning, those guys have been politicized. The politics have gotten to those guys and they may or may not have been, you know, whispered in the ear. Look, you know, when you finish being chief, you're going to be, a, you know, mayor or whatever the case is. You know, some of these things actually happen. Guys that are in the police department that move up have different aspirations. And unfortunately, sometimes that's political, you know, and politics in the police department from a political standpoint, not internal politics, needs to be there needs to be a wall there. You know, and that's what I think really part of the problem is also like, especially here for a New York city council. I mean, all of them hate the police department and you can tell it just by the way of the lack of support, you know, and I'm talking money, you know, it should be at this point in time, whatever it is that you need, you should get. That's how you show your support. What do you think, what do you think needs to change throughout, throughout at least the policing culture and from from we'll say leadership in the police department to be able to to get some of the get more training and 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 get this get this defense tactics training to be regular and actually take it seriously. Well, I mean, <laughs> one thing that you could do that wouldn't be actually very popular is that whoever the whoever the commander is, if there's you know excessive force claims, whatever the case is, because of lack of training, that that chief is also put on the hook, you know, and also listed as a defendant, right? That's one way to do it, but that'll never happen, you know, because there's nobody's held accountable. That, that's exactly the problem. Nobody is held, they're passing the buck. If you talk to the local, your local precinct and you, you talk to the CO there, uh, they're not giving us any money for overtime. You know, if you go to another supervisor, we're not getting any money. You know, you go to the guys that are, you go to the guys that are higher, they say, oh, we don't have the staff, right? Now it's not money. Now it's, we don't have the staff. Then you go to the assistant chiefs. Uh, we don't have the time, right? So you have to do all of those so that your guys are protected on the street. And so that the city, the people that you're protecting and the taxpayer who pays you is not on the hook for 90 million, you know, but, but I think it's going to take, it's going to take like, again, talking about New York City, it would take somebody to really go up to Albany and say, hey, I need $30 million this year to train NYPD for defensive tactical training and have that money actually earmarked for that. You know, and the other thing that you can do is with regard to uh, trainers, again, speaking only NYPD, they only have a certain amount of trainers, right? There's only a certain amount of them. There's not hundreds of them. Um, and they're all NYPD employees. But the NYPD, like the city of New York, when they need something done and they can't handle it, they hire outside contractors, mm -hmm. who many times are much better than the people whose 
we're trained to do the job internally. So why not, and again, this is not just for the NYPD, this could be for any police department. Why not hire outside trainers, hire outside vendors that will abide by the teachings of the NYPD, especially when it comes to prohibited, prohibited uh, tactics, and let them train your guys. So right away, you take the staffing part right out, right out the window, right? So now all of a sudden you have, let's say in the city of New York, you hire 50 trainers that are certified NYPD defensive tactical trainers, unarmed. Now you have 50 trainers. You have 50 trainers to send people to now. Mm-hmm. You know, ha- have all classes have to be recorded. Everybody has to go through background checks. You have to be fingerprinted, bonded, insured, you know, all, all that, all that stuff. That, that's a given, right? You have to go through the NYPD tactical training so you see what it's about. No problem. If they said that to me, I would do it in a heartbeat. Now, one of the issues I see is, and again, I was talking to a police officer about this, is a lot of police executives get, um, they actually get rewarded or give a bonus or compensated if they keep the budget low, if they yep. keep training budget over time. But the lower they keep it, the more they're in favor with the elected officials. Uh, some of you get money back at the end of the budget year. Yeah, it's yeah. an incentive not to spend money. And and I think that's a big problem. So like you say, the politics, but really inside the agency, there's there's you know, executives that are playing politics. And, and I just think it, it, it muddies the waters. You know, I, I remember when I was in the army, I had a, in my company, we had a Lieutenant uh, came from West point squared away platoon leader. Um, one of his officer, or officer, one of his soldiers got a DUI. He was given a counseling statement, uh, uh, article 15, 45 days restriction, extra duty. The, that soldier less than a year later got another DUI. You know what they did to the Lieutenant who was at home at bed when that happened? They Probably relieved nothing. them. They relieved Did they them. really? Mm-hmm. That's the army. The, the mantra is this. I am responsible for everything that happens on my watch, whether I know about it or not. Right. I'm responsible. Where I feel like in law enforcement, we just are so good about pointing the fingers. Wait, I'm the, I'm the executive. I'm the chief. I'm the leader. Mm-hmm. I'm the commander. I'm the superintendent. Mm-hmm. I have all this authority, except when something goes bad. It's like, whoa, I was home in bed that night. You know, like mm-hmm. we just got to get back to ownership. Leaders have to own it. If, if my guys are sued, that means I did something wrong. If, if my guys get hurt, that's because I didn't train them hard enough. You know, right. we need to start getting back to that ownership mentality. And I think you'll see over a generation that will change. But until that, it's just uh, let's keep the cost down. Let's uh, come and fill the cars and do our shifts. And uh, let's hope we make it through the day. Right. And that's it. Because I think when you're, when you're a lower ranked officer and you're looking at, you know, the corner office, the thing to do is to get around your shift or the day, the week, month, year, whatever it is, as unscathed as you possibly can and without controversy, right? Both of those don't mix with, you know, tactical training, right? So, you know, it's it's a real problem and it's going to continue to be a problem in cities, counties, and states where the politicians are not 100% behind law enforcement. You know, it should be whatever it is you need. You know, we're going to give you whatever it is that, that you need to be more effective on the street, because we know at the end of the day, if you're not, the bullet's going to come back to us because we're going to end up getting sued. Right. And that's exactly what happens. You know, and then what happens is that when you have when you have uh, cities like like New York City. That has multiple, multiple lawsuits going on. What the city um, attorneys will do is many times they'll just settle these cases out of court. And that to me sets a bad precedence because people go, easy money. All I have to do is sue the NYPD and say, they did this to me, they did that to me. And in order to make me go away, they'll give me 20, 30 grand or 40 grand. Not only does that put the taxpayer behind the eight ball, but it gives the cop a black eye for something that may or may not have happened, right? And now it shows everybody else that the gravy train is full and running. Just come pick it, right? That's the wrong message to be sending. That's the wrong message to be sending. But yet, for years, New York City has been sending that same exact message. You know, and I'm not saying this for the cops that truly are not doing their jobs, for the cops that are truly manhandling people. You know, those cops have to be disciplined. And if so, they have to be fired. You know, there's no reason to do that. But again, I believe that be, that comes from lack of tactical skills. You know, you, because you... You're so uncertain whether you could handle this guy that you right, right away barrage him with whatever. When in reality, that's not really what you needed. 
right? But again, if you don't have the training, you believe you don't have the ability to take this guy down or to properly detain him. So, you know, instead of throwing 50 pounds at him, you throw 300 pounds at the guy, all right? You know, and then there are other tactical things that you still look at and you still wonder, you know, why? I mean, you just look at it and you go, they had enough time, you know, like if you look at the Eric Gardner case, right? So you look at that and you go, why, you know? The guy's 400 pounds. He's not going anywhere. He's not running to his house, right? So, you know, I think, you know, and again, so one of the things I stress when it comes to that training of things like that are stand-up takedowns. How are you taking this guy down, right? You're by yourself. How do you take him down? It's you and your partner. How do you take him down? It's three of you. How do you take him down? You know, effectively, safely, and before the guy knows what happens, the cuffs are on him, right? But they don't train like that. Like I've had these conversations with, members of the NYP that have come to train with me. I say, when you guys go out on a shift, are you guys saying, okay, you know, if anything goes down today, you know, you, you have legs. So I know today, today is my job. I have legs. So if something happens and we're in a situation like that, I don't even think I go right for the legs. You know, is there any talking in between there? No, there's not. You know, you, again, you've seen the YouTube videos, right? Rolling around on the floor, you know, Tasers don't work on bars that I'm going, that's, that would never work in a million years. I don't even know why you're trying that, you know, and then ultimately, you know, the perp subject gets up and he walks away and I'm going, how did that happen? You had the guy on the floor, you know, I just watched a video like that the other day, two cops on one guy, third cop came, had him. They went to go cuff him. Somebody either let go or whatever guy got up and took off. My, um, my last police department is we did have a great um, training and tactic that we implemented. I think it was after, it might've been after the Eric Gardner issue and it was for holding someone down. And it was, you know, you, the first person, you know, the first two would be on the arms. The next person would be right. on the legs. One person would control the head. And then beyond that, the officers would just be on the radio watching, checking in. So we never had more than more than five people around them around the part, it was either four or five, if, whether it was one on each leg or one on just the legs. That's what I'm saying. Never, never had be, more than that on a suspect and we're never right. on top of them anymore. There has to be a coordinated effort. There's no reason why it should take eight guys to eight cops to take one guy down. There, there really isn't. I mean, clearly there are cases, PCP and things like that, right? Clearly those are, those are the, not the norms that you would usually see. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's no different, you know, that you have a, you have a job, you know, whatever it is, like I said, we, we, I, I trained um, in, in New York. We have uh, the Joint Task Force for Empire Shield, which is part of the military. And they were enacted after 9-11. And part of their job is, was basically to watch like JFK, LaGuardia, uh, Grand Central Station, things like that, right? Port Authority, la large areas. So I, I taught them not a little bit after 9-11, but I just taught them a couple of Actually, in December, I had two classes with them and we did the same thing. So I grabbed the, the guy, the biggest guy that was there was 6'4", 265 pounds, right? So clearly was much taller than me, outweighed me by 100 pounds. And they usually walk in forces of three. So I said, okay. So I, we whispered to each other what we were going to do beforehand. And he stood up and said, okay, you know, we're going to attempt to take you down, put your hands up. No, he was resisting. I just walked over, grabbed, grabbed his legs by his ankles and just pulled him in. And one guy just pushed him. He just fell right over. Right. So that's what I'm saying. You know, if it was one on one, I would never be able to take him down like that. Or even three on one, I would never be able to take him down like that. But you take a guy's legs down, which is so, so elementary that guys just don't think about that. You know, the guy's not running if you have his legs. Right. It's just I, I think sometimes I think they think it's too elementary. Like we can't do that. You know, it's not what you're supposed to be doing. I'm going, do you want to chase the guy for 30 blocks or you want him to fall on his face in front of you? John, as we as we start to wrap up, I, I know Chad, you, you and Chad went over you know, a little earlier where, where someone should start. I, I think you mentioned a great starting point would, would be taking some Taekwondo, right? Yeah, if they have time. You know, if time, time. If time so, allows, because it allows them to be able to have an understanding of how to move. Yeah. But if they don't, you know, they need something like now, like they really need something now, then I would say Japanese jiu-jitsu, Krav Maga, some sort of Chinese system like Wing Chun, Kung Fu, something like that. So I'm a firm believer in extreme ownership and that we can't always, it, I should say, it was easy for me to blame my department 
for their failing to train me when I was a police officer. I've learned since then, you know what, I, I should have taken some of that upon myself and sought out the training that I wanted on my own. Mm-hmm. So it, say we have an officer that, that's listening to this and realizes I need to do some additional training on my own. Say, say that officer is willing to be able to invest one class a week into one of the martial arts on a consistent basis, do you, do you think is, and is that going to help him moving forward? Well, listen, one time a week is better than no time a week, right? Right. Yeah. And the more, the more obviously you could do the, the better chances of muscle memory setting in. But again, you have to make sure that whatever trainer that you go to or whatever martial arts or dojo that you go to is that they also teach stress training as well. Right. You have to be able to work under duress or under stress so that the adrenaline is flowing. You know, that that's one thing that you have to do. And I, and I think uh, one, I guess one suggestion I would give also is that one of the other things that I see when it comes to training, and I don't know why guys train like this, but they train at a hundred miles an hour, right? Right away. Everything's very fast, very, the, and I'm going, that makes no sense. You have no idea what you're doing. Why would you do that? And the reason why I don't train like that in the beginning and the reason why I really think it hurts the student, especially if they're law enforcement, is because one of the first things that happens is that when you attack somebody very fast and they've had limited to no training, whether they're an officer or not, but obviously we're talking about officers here, is you get that flinch mechanism. Even if they don't turn their head, what you will see them do nine times out of 10 is momentarily shut their eyes. That's a problem. So the way to combat that is to train slowly, all right? And the other thing that they need to be concerned about is like we do instinctive training, right? So in other words, I'll stand in front of you with a knife and I'll attack you five different ways. You don't know what's happening, but I'm gonna attack you five different ways. So let's say I slash you, you do the defense, you throw me on the ground, I pop right back up, which is totally unrealistic. But for this purpose of training, I pop right back up and I do a different type of attack. I switch hands or whatever it is. The problem with training like that too quickly is that people start to think too much. And what I mean by that is when you're standing there before the attack happens, the defender will go, oh, if they slash me, I'm going to do this defense. If they stab me, I'm going to do this defense. So there's too many things running in their head. And what happens, you always get killed. So there's a Japanese saying called mushin, which is basically like no mind, um, where your mind is totally blank and you're just basically looking at the person in front of you and you're letting your instincts of what you learned previously do the job. So that's what I bring to the table. So I'll bring that instinctive part of it, slow training. And then once they get the feel for it, then the stressful training comes into play because that's what you're going to bring to the street. That's what you're going to get in the street. And that's how you're going to um, react when you're in the street. John, this was amazing, man. I, really grateful you came on. Wow. So, so good detail. I'm looking at the time, like, did an hour really just go by? That was crazy. Like, wow. Where can people find you? Like, let's say people want to connect with you. I know um, you, you have a GoFundMe to go to take money for training. So, you yes. know, where can people contact you at? Yes, yeah, so we have GoFundMe, uh, LinkedIn, obviously, since we're, we're connected on LinkedIn. Um, um, on Instagram and cat underscore training for Instagram and then uh, non lethal force training.com for website. But either way, either way, website, Instagram, LinkedIn, it doesn't matter. That's incredible. Yeah, we're going to put all your contact info, we'll put your links in the description. And John, thank you so much for doing this. Really My appreciate pleasure. it. Thank you for coming this, on, John. Yeah, this is really amazing. So and the GoFundMe, I'm really trying to raise a lot of money. So right now, I'm the only one that put money in and I had to take it out for tax purposes. So <laughs> I would really love to fill that kitty and just give these guys training for free because then money will not be an issue. We're going to blast your link GoFundMe. We are going to try to get you some money. So go donate. I'm going to donate. I'll tell you right now, I will donate. I will put it in there. And we're going to try to get many people to donate because this is important training. We need to get this out there more. Thank you. I, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it, guys. Thank Thanks, you. John. All the best to you. You too. Stay well. Thank you.